So I took to Twitter to ask all of you out there, what do you want me to review next as part of the Retro Review series? And you give me all types of suggestions. I ask you to keep it to shows that happened historically in November or December and got several, several suggestions for this one. In your house, D-Generation X, December 7th, 1997. For all of you that suggested this, suck it. Suck it. Suck it. Suck it. Suck it. <laughs> this was bad. <laughs> now, thinking about this from a historical lens, like this was a relevant and significant show in this sense. When you think back to this time frame of 1997, you know, for me, I've always looked at 1997 for both WWF and frankly for wrestling as a whole, and I argue that it's my favorite year of wrestling of all. Because ECW was arguably as hot as it ever was. WCW was as hot as it ever was. WWF wasn't all the way there, but from the beginning to the end of the year, you could see such a seismic change and shift in the tone, the culture, the presentation of the WWF product that you knew, even back then, that you were heading for some really good times. You really did. So... Looking at this show, you know, there's still those feelings of nostalgia attached, for sure. And you also got to look at this and say, this was the first real featured pay-per-view for WWF after the Montreal Screwjob Survivor Series 97. When you got heat, you got to capitalize on it. And certainly there was a lot of heat on the, at the time within the company from fans for Degeneration X. And especially for Shawn Michaels. And this is even before you get to Survivor Series. And then once you get to Survivor Series and they screwed Brett? Yeah, man. Like, there was significant heat here for Shawn Michaels. And it absolutely fundamentally made sense that you would build one of these lesser secondary in-your-house pay-per-views around D-Generation X. Again, if you've got heat... You go after it, and you take advantage of it every way you possibly can. Unfortunately, this show was not exactly the best way to do that. When your best match on the card is your opening match, as a general rule, your show is not going to be very good. The opening match was uh, the conclusion, the culmination of the light heavyweight championship tournament they were going to crown the first light heavyweight champion. It was Brian Christopher and Taka Michinoku. Um, this was very good. Like going back and seeing two sexy Brian Christopher in these heel days with his dad sitting there pumping gas up him the whole time on commentary. You know, even getting involved at one point trying to, you know, help his son out. Like, this was really good. It felt like in a lot of ways that this match was being carried, ironically enough, by Brian Christopher and Jerry the King Lawler on commentary. Uh, more, way more so than it was Taka Michinoku, but um, this, was, this match was a lot of fun. Like, this is the type of stuff you used to get that would be a part of the card, but you didn't have it all throughout the card, but it, when it was this match and it was like the only match that was like it on the card, it was really good, and this certainly was. Taka Michinoku won. At the end of the match, you have Tony Gurria, Gerald Briscoe, Pat Patterson are out there and giving him the first light heavyweight championship. Really good way to start the show. So when you go back and watch this and you say, man, this is the opening match, set a pretty good bar and a pretty good standard that the rest of the show did its best to absolutely positively not live up to. Los Berwikwa. This is what happens when you're recording after midnight and you're gassed. You start botching like you're freaking Dino Bravo, except for one thing, he's dead. Los Bariquas versus DOA. Oh, God. I, I don't know why, and I don't really care to know why at this point, why they didn't have Savio Vega in this match. Like, you're going to have a six-man tag, but you're not going to have the real workhorse and Savio Vega in the match. Seems like an interesting decision. And the fact that... That the fans are more focused on one of the members of Los Bariquas uh, needing to shave their back. Like, that's the chant that breaks out during the match. Like, this, this was not good. 
this wasn't even a raw worthy match really from that time. It was it was a mess and it was poorly worked. And usually I'm not big on that type of stuff. I, I'm not as concerned about the pure work and everything else, but this was it was just not good. It it just wasn't. You know, and maybe sitting there and having to have the jackal and <laughs> whoever it was sit there and try and pump up and hype up the freaking uh Hotline shit, hotline shit for five minutes. Maybe it took some steam out of the show. I don't know what the hell it was, but it was not good. I've always found it interesting to me. At key points in time in the company's history, they would say, we got somebody we want to ruin their push. We're going to bring in Butterbean. Now, Butterbean, to be fair, at this time, was a star. He was a mainstream name. There is absolutely no question about it. So the night after having fought in a in a boxing pay per view, now you're bringing him in here, and he's taking on marvelous Mark Marrow in a ten minute tough man contest. Like that's a pretty good get for this company at the time. Uh, a Mike Tyson, extremely super white and light. Uh, you know, you might say, well, this is somewhat similar to like a Mr. T and a Roddy Roddy Piper. Yeah, with none of the charisma or personality. Uh, but when you go back and look at Mark Marrow, man. You know, Mark Merrill was never going to be world championship material, but I always resented how you got to about this point in time and it was clearly obvious that they had such a hard-on for Sable, and that being Vince Russo and Vince McMahon, that they were willing to totally ruin Mark Merrill in order to try and make her a big star. They absolutely did not. To, to be fair, to a certain degree, they certainly succeeded, but at what cost? You know, like, like Mark was a good talent, and it always felt like they were really not concerned with him, really not interested in with him. The whole thing of, you bring in Johnny B. Bad to the company, and then you realize he can't be Johnny B. Bad, and that's the only thing he really knows how to do. So you try to do these different things. You make him the wild man and everything else. And I think the fans liked him enough, and I felt like he deserved better. Um, this was some work crap bullshit, frankly. These guys just threw soft-ass punches for several minutes. And what was a common theme for the night? One of four matches that ended in a DQ finish. When you think back to the Attitude Era, and this being the real early stages, formative days of what would become the Attitude Era, you know, you got some good out of that era for sure. But you also got a lot of foolishness and a lot of crap. A lot of overbooked finishes, a lot of DQs, a lot of unclear, non-clean finishes. And that was, again, a theme throughout this. Like, if Mark Merrill loses to Butter being clean, is that really going to hurt Mark Merrill? You just had to do some type of wishy-washy DQ finish. It was, it was not good. And then it appeared like they were trying to kill some time. Um, so they had the artist formally held it as Gold Dust come out and Luna come out. And this is when they've done the whole, like, she's the femdom thing. And, you know, I, I admittedly, I popped for seeing Luna because it always pisses me off. And it still pisses me off to this day that... Uh, Luna gets the China treatment, or China gets the Luna treatment. However you wanna, however you wanna put it. Like Luna, Luna was a fantastic talent. She wasn't just a fantastic woman in the business. She wasn't just a fantastic manager. She was just fantastic. Period. Like she was a real talent. And most everything that she was associated with was better off because she was associated with it. And the fact that they haven't put her legitimately in the Hall of Fame. And not one of these, hey, we throw her in with this schmoz of 50 other people so we have to put them in a ceremony. But the fact that she didn't get her own call out and her own spot is a complete crock of crap. Now, this segment, however, you know, even though the artist formerly known as Goldust, like, this is when it was getting weird and kind of stupid and that I, I like that sometimes. Like, having Goldust come out and reading the cat in the hat, like, no, it, it's a, it's a, it's a hard no for me. <laughs> this was bad. And it just, again, fit for the theme of the night. Your WWF Tag Team Championship match featured the Legion of Doom and New Age Outlaws. Like, it felt like in a lot of ways there was a lot of comedy built into this show, and maybe that was appropriate because it was called In Your House Degeneration X. But if you go back and watch anything from the show, and I emphasize again, if there is one thing and only one thing you need to go back and watch from this show... It is this backstage interview before the match with the Road Warriors. Now, certainly some of you have seen these clips over the years. Certainly some of you have seen this clip when you watch the Road Warriors DVD set. Um, the bottom line is, 
is while animals doing kind of what animal does, his typical run-of-the-mill stuff, when Hawk starts going on to the rant about how Mr. Dog, Mr. Ass, you two are like a deeply embedded booger inside of my right nostril. The fact that Hawk could cut a two or three minute promo comparing Road Dog and Mr. Ass to freaking a booger in his nostril and make it work is hilarity of the highest order and speaks to just how much of a charismatic individual Mike Hed Hegstrand Hawk was on the mic. And we don't always often think of him like that, but he absolutely, absolutely freaking was. Like, of course, the match ended up finishing with a wishy-washy DQ finish because, again, that was going to be a theme for the night. But if you have anything that you got to go back and watch for this show, I'm telling you right now, you must go back and you must watch Hawk's performance on the backstage pre-match interview because it is gold, baby! Gold! What wasn't gold, though, was that boot camp match. Now, I, watched, I was watching this, and it's been 20 years plus since I've watched this, so forgive me here. But as I'm watching it, it felt like this boot camp match with Sergeant Slaughter and Triple H. While understandable in premise and concept certainly makes sense, certainly feels like, hey, here's a chance to take a legend and have him put somebody over that's going to be God in the future. Like, that makes sense. And, you know, you're going back to an old gimmick from Slaughter's days going way back in the early 80s, wrestling Pat Patterson, the boot camp match. It's an extreme rules type of match. Anything goes. How can you possibly screw it up? And this was bad. This was really, really bad. Like, people might talk about worst matches of Triple H's career and say, hey, WrestleMania 12 against Ultimate Warriors at the top of the list. I would put this boot camp match way above that. Because at least you could say what happened with Warrior was a squash. It was over in a gif with a snap of a finger. Here, it felt like it went on and on. And on and on. And the reality is, is I think the match was more like 10 to 11 minutes. It might have been a little bit longer, but it felt like an hour. It was really bad. Like, it could have been really good if Sergeant Slaughter could go. He couldn't go anymore. He couldn't go anymore. And while Triple H was starting to become a really good in-ring talent, I don't think he was all the way there yet. He certainly wasn't in peak Hunter Hearst Helmsley form. Like, if I remember correctly, though, this might have been the first time that he was introduced as a paper at a pay-per-view wrestling under the Triple H name instead of them just always saying, Hunter Hust Helmsley! Hunter Hust Helmsley! Hunter Hust Helmsley! Hunter Hust Helmsley! And God, somebody eventually figured it out. Uh, well, who, well, hey, Vince, uh, you can just shorten that up to three H's and let's call him Triple H. My God, that's brilliant! Glad I saw of it! No more Hunter Hust Helmsley! Um, God damn, this boot camp match was brutally boring. It was bad. It was terrible. When the crowd sitting there for an Extreme Rules type of match where you're breaking out different things and you're sitting there and breaking out the freaking belts and everything else and the crowd doesn't move, they don't care, that's what, you know, this thing didn't connect. It didn't land. It was really, really bad. Uh, and you've got China interfering the whole time. Like, it was just a hot mess. The next match, I know this is why some of you a-holes probably suggested this, and I'm not going there. You're not going to get what you want, and I mean it, and I'm serious this time. I ain't got time to do it, I don't have passion to do it, nor does this even deserve it. How dare they put The Undertaker in a situation like this where he's going to have a match against a Power Ranger piece of crap from Tennessee? No, I'm going with this. And the whole time... He's been, the Power Ranger piece of crap's been doing all this stupid crap. I'm going to do a huge promo about how the NWA is a real blessing, and nobody gives a shit. And all the while, you've come off of Undertaker and the revelation of Kane, and you're deep into that. So everybody knows this match has no business even happening. It serves no purpose. We're just waiting time until Kane comes out so this could be a DQ finish, and that's exactly what the hell happened. 
So no, I'm not going to talk about any of that other stuff. So nice try, a-holes, for trying to get me to do so. I'm not going to do it. No. 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 There will be no assumings of any positions this time. I'm sorry to disappoint you. Try again, motherfucker. In a preview of the greatness to come over the next couple of years, you had the Intercontinental Championship match featured The Rock challenging Stone Cold to Steve Austin. And this was fascinating at the time, because even going back to the end of 97, like a little bit earlier in the night, you had Mark Henry get interviewed <laughs> and asking who's who he's got in this match, and he says, oh, Stone Cold's my guy. Well, how quickly that changed in a couple of months, right? But, you know, this is a couple of months into Rock's heel turn, and you can start to see the wheels moving. You can start to see him figuring it out, but he's not all the way there yet. But that's exciting. Like, you could see the formations of what became The Rock, but they weren't there yet. But he was figuring it out, and he was figuring it out in quick order. And for Stone Cold Steve Austin, there is one thing that is beyond a shadow of a doubt, absolutely unequivocally true, for this show absolutely true, is that he was easily the most overact in the company by a wide margin at this point. Like, this is where you really started to get the sense and the vibe and the feel that, even going back to 1997, like, Austin's winning the Rumble, he's going to win this belt at Mania, They've got to be going with Austin. Otherwise, nothing that they do makes any freaking sense whatsoever. And what you got here in this match between Stone Cold and The Rock, it was short. It lasted what all of, what, maybe six minutes. But, man, it was action-packed. It was jam-packed. It had a bunch of crap happen in a short period of time. It's almost like you put this match together and create a video package out of it to give you a preview of what the matches in years to come, like WrestleMania 15, WrestleMania 17, WrestleMania 19 what they would look like, all the other matches that these guys fought together. And if I'm not mistaken, this is also the first time that they wrestled at pay-per-view. Fact check me in case I'm wrong here. Like This is a historical kind of significant match. So maybe if there's another thing that you want to watch out of this show that isn't uh, Michael Hegstrand, Hawk's promo, that he cuts on the <laughs> badass Billy Gunn and the Road Dog, uh, it's probably going back and watching this Intercontinental Championship match and seeing six minutes of absolute ass-kicking awesomeness the biggest problem with this, of course, was that it was way too damn short. Probably could have used a lot less of the boot camp match. We could have used less of the 10-minute tough man. We could have just went without that and without out some other things. But Stone Cold wins. And, you know, this is coming off of the heels of a couple of months before having his neck broken at SummerSlam that year. So, like, this is no small feat for Austin to be in this spot and, and be able to do something like this. And... You know, even the fact that it wasn't all that long, the fact that he was even able to wrestle at all was a borderline damn miracle. Imagine how different the company would have been if he would have never been able to wrestle again. Ooh, talk about interesting. Which brings us to the main event. Again, this was In Your House Degeneration X, so it makes sense naturally that it was going to be built around Degeneration X, and specifically the WWF champion at the time, the leader of Degeneration X, Shawn Michaels. And... To me, this is the match I'm trying to figure out. Like, If you had this match today, the WWF, now WWE, would get so much shit because so many fans would talk about, this is not how you make your champion look credible. This is not how you capitalize on the heat for your new world champion. He's got to get all this help from Triple H in China, and he's only taken on one guy. Like, that makes your champion look weak. That makes the challenger look weak. And all of this, and you know what? Especially in modern era, I would agree with that sentiment a lot of times. And even going back then, you know, I would make I would make a sentiment at the time of, I would largely agree with you. But in this case, I think it actually made sense. Because Shawn Michaels, even you heard Lawler and uh, JR, who were, again, gold on commentary here, so glad that they got Vince the hell out of the way and started to let these two guys really run with it because you were really getting something special here. Um, but, you know, they were billing them as uh, how noxious they are. Like, even the pre-match promo, Shawn Michaels is sitting there calling JR basically a fat tub of goo. Like, you know, they're supposed to be grimy and you're supposed to hate them at this point, even though because 
of where wrestling and pop culture was at the time. Like you go so edgy and heelish that you become really cool and you become the biggest baby faces in the room in some ways. Um, but it made sense to me that Shawn Michaels needed help because he didn't even win the belt legitimately from Brett at Survivor Series. And now you throw in the element of you got Earl Hebner in here as the ref. Like you've got Shawn Michaels. He's the guy with all the heat right now. So why wouldn't you try to keep that heat on him? So when you're thinking about that and you're thinking about the fact that they're trying to break all the rules and everything else, it absolutely makes sense that Triple H in China would be getting involved heavily and it would be an overbooked um, piece of crap type of match structure because that's what you had to do, especially when you're thinking about it from a pure legitimately st legitimacy standpoint. As great of an in-ring worker and performer that Shawn Michaels was, he was in the ring with a looming looming, raging lunatic psycho Ken Shamrock. I don't mean that literally, but you know what I mean. Like, Shamrock was a badass. Like, this is a legit dude. This is a dude from the early days of the UFC. This is a guy, you know, that you knew that Ken Shamrock was serious. You knew that he was legit. And you know if this was legit, that he would destroy Shawn Michaels. So he was going to need help throughout the match to even have a chance. And some might say, well, it felt like Sean wasn't going full speed here. And in some ways you could tie that into kind of the character and mindset and attitude of the gimmick at the time and the, and the performer as well, Shawn Michaels, where he just kind of didn't really give a crap. And maybe he was working a little hurt at the time, but more so really didn't give a crap. And that kind of came through. And you're like, man, this is not that standard of performance from Shawn Michaels that you would expect. True. But then you also look at the fact that he's working with Ken Shamrock. And Shamrock, you know, bless his heart, I loved Ken Shamrock. I thought the character kicked ass. I thought the performer kicked ass for what he was. But he was not going to put on a ton of lengthy chain wrestling masterpieces. So you had to do the best you could with what you have. Like, even look at one point in time when they're running the ropes. Like, I don't know how Ken Shamrock didn't get significantly, severely concussed when his head fell between the top rope and the middle rope and it, like, bounced up and down. Like, how the hell did he even get up? That's because Ken Shamrock was a legit badass and still is to this day. My only gripe and complaint with this match, because you could say, well, this was a basement-level match for Shawn Michaels, and I would agree. You would say this is a pretty good match for Ken Shamrock, especially in the main event spot. I would agree. I think my only frustration with this period of time was that you couldn't find a way to have Ken Shamrock win the WWF Championship. Like he, he, was, he was not next in line. It was always clear that eventually you were going to Austin and he was going to be next in line. But if something would have been wrong with Austin's neck or something else would have happened, like... You could see a place where they could have potentially made plans where they were going to put Shamrock in that spot, at least as a placeholder, until they figured out what the we're going to do now. Um, so I've always had a little bit of animosity towards a company that they didn't figure out a way, somehow, some way, in 97, 98, at some point in time, to put the world title on Ken Shamrock. Even if it wasn't for a lengthy period of time, I realized that he wasn't a true franchise type of guy, but he was a legit MFer. And a legit MFer is always going to work to a degree as your world champion. Because even if people want to say your crap is fake and it's hokey and stupid and everything else, Ken Shamrock is not fake, hokey, and stupid. Like he's real deal legit. You could sit there and say, as a wrestling company like WWF at the time, Let's say, hey, we've got the biggest badass as our champion compared to anybody, whether that's wrestling or whether that's mixed martial arts. And you certainly had an argument where you could say that. And I always thought Shamrock's gimmick was believable. Like you believed that he was off his rocker and super intense and aggressive and insane. And he's kind of a calm, reserved, mellow person in real life. But he was really good, where he wasn't very good in terms of projecting personality in terms of the interview. Like, the pre-match interview with Cornette was certainly missable. You know, he had all the personality of paint drying. But once he got out in front of the crowd, once you got out into the ring and he, and he, and he became Ken Shamrock, like, he's a really entertaining dude. And it really bothers me that he's not in the WWE Hall of Fame last I checked. It bothers me that he never got the World Championship. 
because I thought he absolutely should have. Uh, this match, of course, as was a theme for the night, ended in a wishy-washy DQ finish. Um, which, if he hadn't had several other DQ finishes throughout the night, I think this would have carried a lot more weight and a lot more mustard. It was interesting to do it here in the main event because, again, you got to go with the heat when you got the heat. And Shawn Michaels had the heat coming off of Survivor Series in the Montreal Screwjob. So, you know, why not piss off the fans again by saying, hey, Ken Shamrock's about to apply the ankle lock, but he doesn't get the ankle lock in because here come Triple H in China to mess him up, and it's a DQ wishy-washy finish. It made sense. And what really took this finish to a whole different level in terms of the DQ finish being the right call is when out of nowhere, coming and making a beeline for Shawn Michaels, who's standing outside on the ring apron against the ropes, is Owen Hart plowing into the back of him, basically, and knocking Shawn Michaels into the announce table. And then Owen Hart coming straight out and landing all aggressively on him to the point where something happened where Shawn Michaels ended up bleeding from the nose. Like, that shit was believable. Like, Shawn was responsible for screwing Owen's brother at Survivor Series. Now Owen's come, and he wants his effing revenge. Like, this was a fantastic finish. To a pay-per-view match. It was a great, legit surprise. It was executed well. The disappointment came afterwards when, instead of doing the logical thing, which is having Owen take on Sean at Royal Rumble 98, you ended up going with Taker in a casket match. Like, really interesting choice there. And you send Owen instead at Triple H. Like, I always felt like that was really a missed opportunity. And I don't know if that was more... Click DX, Shawn Michaels, backstage BS politics that they didn't want to put Owen in that spot. He wasn't going to put o over Owen, you know. I don't know what was involved there. It just felt really weird that he made such an aggressive play for attacking Shawn Michaels and going after him that you don't send him immediately after Shawn Michaels at the Royal Rumble or even all the way up through to WrestleMania. Like, that always felt like a missed opportunity to me. Um, so, like I said, the... The match was nowhere near like peak Shawn Michaels' performance. It was good for Ken Shamrock. The finish, I thought, absolutely made sense. Especially the post-match stuff really took this to a high level. But this show was not good. <laughs> I don't know historically like how people view this show. I would assume not good. They're going to say overbooked garbage with some really dumb gimmicks and dumb decisions. I completely agree. It's got some redeeming qualities. And from a historical lens, it was interesting to go back and watch it. But now that I've done it again for the first time in over 20 years, I have no interest in ever going back and watching this show from beginning to end ever again. Nor do I necessarily recommend you do that unless you really, 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 really want to.